I want to begin by thanking David. Uh, he is a delight to work with. Um, like Linda and Dan, he is a good communicator. Um, he keeps the dialogue open. He ensures that we have a mutual understanding of various perspectives and uh, has been just a, a true professional. I also really appreciate, again, like Linda and Dan, uh, David's commitment to fairness and civility and the interest of, of the university always being put first. Um, outstanding leadership and I think we're very lucky that uh, you've been willing to serve as our faculty senate president. For that matter, I'd really like to also express to all of you, um, and I think this may be quite a number more of you than last year and the year prior, I'm glad that you could make this. Um, it's really an important time for me to say thank you to you. Um, there are so many things that go so well at this institution despite our challenges and I really attribute that to you. Um, I can't begin to tell you the number of stories that I have about how many things are going well and how much that is really because of so many of you. One of the great things that happened this year is we were able to bring Quest together. Quest is our strategic plan. Quest for Distinction really focuses on what makes VCU different, what are our uniquenesses and such. And so we had to come together with a shared vision and that vision really did come together very well because of the cooperation and involvement of so many of you. We had great faculty participation and I really appreciate that very, very much. Um, Thinking about Quest, I, I try to take Quest and talk about it everywhere I go and in the context of everything I do. This last weekend I had the opportunity, um, again, to go into the Siegel Center to greet and talk with a large number of prospective students. And I understand that it may be the largest group we've ever had. All I can tell you is it's the largest group of prospective students and their families that I have ever seen. And it was a delight to be with that group. I really, really enjoyed it. So I start thinking about how am I going to talk with them about what Quest means prospectively for them as they consider Virginia Commonwealth University as a uh, leading choice for them to attend school. Well, I talked about it in the terms that we have talked about it. Um, and it really is something that applies to just about every other area in the university. Um, or I should say every area of the university. What it really talks about is our expectation that you be your very, very best. You be the very best that you can be. There is no real room for garden variety. That you be committed to being a leader in your field, whatever that field is that you choose. And that you be committed to being a problem solver. We need you to go out into your professions and your communities and create and lead success for all of the people around you. And I felt a tremendous resonation in the room. Um, I was a little bit worried that some of the folks might say, well, don't scare them off before they get here. Tell them they're going to have to work so hard. Well, you know what? You are going to have to work hard. It's one of the greatest things about being human is that we can work hard intellectually, right? And we can, and we can develop a passion, and hopefully it starts when you were in college, to start thinking about how we can better understand all of those things that human beings have never been able to understand. How we can solve all of those problems that we know are out there and just seem to get worse. What information do we need that matters? There's a lot of information out there, right? What information do we need that matters to improving what it means to be a human being in this world? If all of our students thought about that and were committed to leading in their fields, solving problems that need to be solved in their fields, wow, what an incredible place this could be. I also like to tell students, and certainly graduates, who get the same speech at the end, I tell them, you, are now, you have been a part of ECU, you are for now, now and forever a part of Virginia Commonwealth University. Go out there and represent us well, lead in your communities, do everything that you can to make a difference, not only in your own life, but in the lives of other people. And that's one of the things that makes what you bring to the table so important. I cannot begin to tell you how many stories there are about students who I see 
or students who others have seen, but I see a lot of students and they tell me what incredible mentors my faculty colleagues are. What an important difference a faculty member made in their choice of a discipline or in their choice of a life course. I really appreciate everything that you bring to the university. Our colleagues do so much for the foundation of this institution. Just this last year, I can give you a couple of examples of some great things that happened. Some of our colleagues um, have er earned, several of our colleagues have earned Fulbright scholarships. Again, we had a Jefferson Science Fellow, National Science Foundation Career Award, a big deal. Two Guggenheim Fellows, another Virginia Outstanding Scientist Award, at VCU, David just mentioned that. Now having said that, I want you to know that these are great accomplishments at an institution that doesn't have exactly what I would call a level playing field. It isn't as easy here, and we know that, for a lot of different reasons. We've grown a lot at this institution. We had grown a lot at this institution. We are not continuing that. And about three years ago or so, we were told that we would lose $63.5 million out of what was only a $205 million base appropriation as one of the state's public universities. That's a lot of money. And in 2008, Virginia universities were ranked among the nation in terms of appropriated dollars per FTE student as 40th out of 50. I don't know what the number is today. I don't know what the rank would be, I should say. So I want to take a moment again to say thank you to you for everything that you do, for your persistence, for your incredible hard work. What you're doing in so many ways is modeling for students, the people who we care most about, what it means for us to tell them that we have high expectations of them. You have high expectations of you, and you know that. You hold, those, you hold yourselves to high expectations, and I appreciate that. It has been difficult, but you have not in any way that I know of let students down or let our mission down, and I really appreciate it. Many of you participated in something that was very special to me, and I really appreciate it. That was the inauguration last fall. Governor McDonald wondered why it was my third year and we were inaugurating me, but um, it was good enough and I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. The, the primary theme in that was really to tell you that I think it's time for a research university like VCU to stop trying to do more with less and to do what's important better. That was something I said, I think I said it several times. If I didn't say it several times, I meant it several times and I continue to mean it. It's very, very important. So we faced this major cut in our appropriation and we delved into Quest. Quest for Distinction. Quest is an ambitious plan, but it makes some very specific choices. It talks about where we need to go and the things that we need to focus on. Quest is not about enrollment growth. It is about more graduates in the Commonwealth. And when I say in the Commonwealth, that means more than just producing tons of graduates. It does mean m producing more graduates, but we need to be sure that as one of the few research universities in the state, we take some responsibility for figuring out how we're going to retain those graduates. We do that with our great ideas in figuring out how to commercialize a lot of those ideas into businesses that will pay well and keep our graduates here. And from my standpoint, keeping them here in Richmond is as important as anything else. We need to continue to commit to students who are <coughs> motivated, and have the right readiness level for this institution. The kind of institution that we are, an academically rigorous public research university. We will continue to put increased emphasis on retention of our students. We've had a great year, 85% retention rate of our freshmen. I particularly thank our colleagues in the University College. They have a lot to do with this, and I'm very, very grateful for that. Our graduation numbers continue to improve. Just last year we had 450 more degrees that were awarded at the university than in 2009-10.
We must continue to, we have, but we must continue to develop competitive aid for competitive students at this institution. We cannot be clueless about the fact that students who are a good match for a research university have options, and they and their families know it. We need to be competitive with what we offer them if we want them to be a diverse part, a, a part of our diverse community. And they are coming in larger numbers than they have before. And I would tell you that I think a lot of it has to do with competitive aid for competitive students. I'm so glad that so many of you helped me embrace transfer students from wherever, but particularly community colleges. We had the guaranteed transfer program that we did about a year and a half ago. That has been very successful. I'd like it to be even more successful. To my knowledge, Bev, we have more transfers this year uh, than we've ever had, and that number hopefully will continue to rise. It also increases the diversity of our great landscape at this university among students. One of the other things that I think is important to say to you is that we engage students. Every student I talk to has an example of how they did something other than just take 40 courses before they graduated. And I think that's really important. It means so much more to a student when they can take what we are teaching them or that we tell them we expect them to learn about or know and use it immediately. We don't wait four years or five years or six years to use it. We want them to use it right away. Because we know that when you're able to use what we are teaching you or what you are learning, it will stay. It will stick. It will be more meaningful to you. We have many disciplines that are perfect examples of that, and we do it in so many different ways, and I really appreciate what you're doing to help me with that. So you can see why the faculty is so critical to the success of Quest. We have got to figure out with our financial losses, and as we continue to ask students to make investments in their educational experiences at VCU, we have got to figure out how to more, more strategically use our resources, how to redistribute our resources, and how to generate new revenues outside of the ways that we have become accustomed to generating them. We submitted this year um, as a result of TJ21, Top Jobs 21 legislation, which guides higher education and higher education reform, as it's called, and funding. Uh, we, we submitted a six-year plan. And we met with the officials who are overseeing those six-year plans. Our emphasis was on faculty and infrastructure, not just increasing more competitively the pay of our faculty members who are as dedicated as you all are, but also adding to the faculty. I don't know what will happen with that, but I can tell you that to date we are in the middle of searches or we have closed out searches for more than 124 faculty positions at the university. Um, we need to continue to add to that. When I came, I talked with you about that ratio. When I looked at our peer institutions, at least in the state, we were about 500 and some faculty positions behind. I hope that as this decade continues, we are able to add to that 124 faculty positions. I'll do everything I can. I certainly hope that the state will be able to help us with that. We have continued to dedicate and redirect resources toward education and learning. That is specifically instruction. In fact, in the past two years, instructional expenditures at the university have increased three times the amount of administrative expenditures. Yes, they are not all huge numbers, but um, I'm pleased that they are the ratio that they are. Um, Blue mentioned earlier a reference to our Vice President for Finance and Administration who has invited uh, participation in a more inclusive and uh, engaging budget process. That is indeed something that we are charting the course for right now and look forward to everyone's involvement in. You've also read my updates, or probably some of you had, have read my updates. Um, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty if you haven't read my updates. <laughs> Um, I only put a couple of hours into each one. Um, but uh, seriously, I've mentioned the uh, Financial Structure Task Force. In the Financial Structure Task Force, 
um, is very important to the university, particularly as we try to meet our fiduciary responsibilities in an environment where we have an ambitious plan that will cost. So we've got many foundations. We have the university and other entities at the, universe, at the institution under the same brand and name. It's really important that we look at our investments and our cash and, um, for that matter, our debt, our capital assets, and try to figure out how do we best leverage those and ensure that we are maximizing our returns and maximizing the opportunity to invest those resources in our mission. I'm really pleased that this year's governor's, uh, the governor's budget uh, proposal um, calls for a significant, more so than many, for many other institutions, a significant partial restoration of the appropriation that I just described that we've lost. Um, we're talking at this point about, um, at least in, in the educational and in education in general uh, portion of the budget, $8.7 million. Um, 700,000 of that is proposed for student financial assistance, so about 8 million that we know of that we could, uh, that we will hopefully be able to use. It's making its way through the legislative process right now. The governor also talked about capital outlay projects, including um, the library project on this campus. Um, we call it the Cabell Library Information Commons. Um, we desperately need spaces for our students to study. Um, to get together. We should be asking our students to do things together. We do, and we will continue to expand that. And as we do that, we need to remember that there aren't very many places for them to go to meet and to get together and talk about what they need to talk about to make good progress with their learning together. So that project is essential, and it must be funded, at least for plans and working drawings. So I'm continuing to push very hard for that. The governor also talked about um, the second phase of our renovation for Sanger Hall, as well as a project called, um, as you know, the Virginia Treatment Center for Children. That's a bigger project that will have a longer term, but a very important one to VCU's mission, particularly as we talk about our commitment to human health. We have, along those lines, I think made great progress in terms of expanding um, and enriching the physical learning environment. Um, the building I call the University Learning Center, it was once I think called the classroom building. It will be the home for the School of Social Work. It is also going to be the home for the Center for Teaching Excellence. Um, it will be very, very heavily invested in technologies, learning technologies, a place, a great place for students to go, for us to go, to make good uses of technology in our communication and our learning. Um, I'm excited about that project. It is uh, moving up very, very rapidly. Um, you might remember in the first year that we got together, we talked about the Living Learning Village on West Gray Street. Um, that's coming together very nicely. The first uh, project will be opening very soon here. It is uh, going to have a theme, a focus. The focus is community engagement, something that's a huge investment at the university something that we've done very well with. Across the street on the north side of Gray, West Grace will be the global education themed residence hall. The McLaughlin Medical Education Center um, is coming together very nicely and very rapidly now, and I'm glad it's rapidly because we were just sitting in my office realizing that that opens about a year from now, and we need to be sure that that does make good progress. It's a really important project. It's a huge number of square feet. But more importantly, it represents a major linchpin in our founding academic, uh, academic program, medical education, back in 1838. It's very important that that pro program um, continue to make good progress um, in the modern era. Um, and I think that that building will really help us with um, the new curriculum. So I'm very excited about that. And then, of course, all of you are somewhat familiar with the um, Institute for Contemporary Art that we are um, more than just talking about now um, at the corner of Belvedere and Broad. I really think it'll be a wonderful gateway to this campus. Um, I think it's going to revolutionize Broad Street um, and certainly Richmond. It will probably redefine Richmond and become a major icon in the city. I'm very excited about that. So continuing with Quest and its ambitiousness, we recognize that the state has not done terribly well, um, not 
like any other state, has really done that well. Um, all of our systems that have been around for a long time are being tested economically. I don't know where it's all going. I don't know that anybody really knows where it's all going, but I don't want to sit totally dependent on that turning around. So with that, um, and my, my personal passion that I know most of you share for our mission, our vision, um, it's really important that we continue to achieve greater financial independence. We had a great year this year with some really forward-thinking gifts. The McLaughlins gave $25 million to the McLaughlin Medical Education Center. Um, very pr appreciative of that. Tremendous uh, landmark gift um, this year. Um, we have realized about $45 million due to the wonderful vision of Margaret and Arthur Glasgow. Imagine in the 1950s they thought about this then. They thought about how they could contribute to medical education, specifically focusing in ways that would help people deal with issues around cancer and other degenerative diseases. And we will really benefit from that. We have got to figure out how to strengthen significantly our endowment as a university. We are behind. I don't know that we need to be behind, but we are behind. There are a lot of reasons for that. I'm hoping the Financial Structure Task Force tackles that with good information. We need to expand alumni engagement. Um, we know that. We have what I call the pyramid of involvement. We need lots of involvement at all levels. I'm excited about alumni being engaged, not just because I think that they will give more, but because I think it will give them an opportunity to make more of a mark for the rest of their lives on the university that they all grow to love. And you need to realize that I see development maybe differently than a lot of people do. Fundraising and development really is people giving to people. So think about it. What do we do here? What's our mission? Our interactions with students ultimately help make them graduates. Their success, they know, is connected to their experiences, their learning experiences. They want to give to their alma mater, typically, but they usually want to give because of a relationship that they have with you. So my vision of development, as we significantly expand it, and we will, will involve you. And I look forward to hearing your ideas, particularly as we start thinking about a campaign a major campaign that focuses us on really specific commitments that we need to raise funds for. The other thing that I really think we need to make some progress with is we need to do a better job of telling our story. There's a new member of the team who joined recently and said, you know, it's interesting how many people talk about other institutions as if VCU isn't there. Well, I'm here to say VCU is there and it's rising. And it's important for us to tell our story, and it's really important for us to be clear about our brand. I know people don't like, that sounds like an evil term, right, in an academic environment. You know what, we need to get used to it. Young people out there who are thinking about schools are thinking about brands. They need to know what it is we stand for, what the experience will be at Virginia Commonwealth University, and why, if they are highly motivated and ready for the VCU experience, why they need to come here, and why we want them to be here. And we'll be talking about that more because we have a branding study that, we're, that is underway now. I'm really pleased last year that the Carnegie Foundation realized, I think it was actually a, a misstep, but they realized that Virginia Commonwealth University is in the highest category that they offer for research universities. I'm also really pleased that last year um, we were able to get the CTSA award going, the Clinical Translation Science Award going. There are many of you who are probably involved in that. But it really made a strong statement about VCU is a serious research university. Last year we had a record year with great funding, $256 million. That's very good. It's very important because it helps fund your ideas and the great ideas of our colleagues at the university. I have to tell you that I'm concerned though a lot of that came from stimulus funding that is now gone so we cannot expect a record beyond that every year we have to figure out where our place is 
and continue to move forward despite the fact that R&D budgets probably are going to continue to be flat. So what does that mean? We need to be more competitive. We need to figure out how we're going to get a greater market share. And the only way we can do that is literally project by project, department by department. So if my department brought in $7 million last year, my department ought to figure out how we need to change, thing, change up our game so that we can bring in at least that much, if not more. The competition for few resources is tremendous. And the best story you can offer is how what you're going to do is going to become a, a nationally interpretable model and how what you're doing is going to improve the quality of people's lives. That's what VCU does so well. In the meantime, um, I continue to be really pleased with uh, the, the uh, President's Research Incentive Program. I created it. I don't really remember the name of it. But all I know is it's one of these things that I thought would be really helpful to our faculty colleagues in getting going again if you need to restart your research career. I mean, we all have doctoral degrees or terminal degrees, and we all were required to do really um, and, uh, creative and, and um, original research. Well, it's important for us to stay engaged. And for those who needed a little bit of support, <clears throat> I hope that's been helpful. We funded 50 projects. The next round, by the way, is due April 1st. And that is not a joke since it's April Fool's Day. Um, it is a real date. Uh, and I hope that you will help me encourage our colleagues who have not submitted a PRIP uh, proposal to do so. One of the things that I mentioned to you earlier was how much I enjoy speaking with students. And you know, one of the things that they say all of the time that I love so much is how much they value the diversity of our environment. It is wonderful. It truly is wonderful. Just walking outside is wonderful. Um, when I see them, I remember why I do this, um, why I do the things sometimes that I really don't like to have to do. And um, there are a lot of things that I love to do, but why I do any of this um, is really because of them. I love what happens to their lives. Their lives are changed forever thanks to you thanks to our faculty. And I'm very, very grateful for that. I'm grateful that they recognize the diversity of the student body. You help foster that. We also have to figure out how we are going to expand further the diversity of our student body and expand the diversity of the entire university community. We have some work to do there, and I think we'll make good headway. One of the things that I'm going to do, given the role I have, is I'm going to move forward with a Vice President for Diversity and Equity. We have that search well underway. We're making great headway with it. Um, we're down to some finalists right now. I'm excited to meet them. I have not met them yet. Um, I'm excited about that process because I think it will really help us with respect to policy and learning that we all need to engage in to be sure that we are fostering a more diverse environment. I also know, having said that, that that will be yet another one single individual. I know that I can count on you to help me ensure that this environment is civil, safe, and fair, and supportive of everyone, every human being in this environment. I know I can count on you for that, and I'm grateful for that. And when you're not sure that's happening, I hope you'll remember that you are one of few in a very large community of a large number of people. I hope you'll speak up and do the right thing and help make sure that everyone feels supported in our environment, regardless of what attributes they might bring to the university. We should be embracing their attributes that are different. One other element of Quest that's interesting is our university-wide commitment to human health. Very few universities this size can do that or do do that. I'm glad that we do. Um, it played out in a really interesting way this year when we enjoyed um, having our colleagues succeed in separating the conjoined twins, Maria and Teresa Tapia of the Dominican Republic. 
Um, what impressed me most was not just the surgeons and other physicians, um, the nurses and our other healthcare partners, their work, but also the number of people who came from so many other parts of the university to help. Students and faculty from sculpture, fashion design, occupational therapy. I was really proud and really impressed that so many people contributed to this successful process that changed these, this family's life forever. Just incredible. And I'm so proud that we were a part of that. I'm also really pleased that Massey Cancer Center continues to, to enjoy a good boost. You know that we want to, under the National Cancer Institute's designations, become what's called a comprehensive cancer center. It's very important for us, given all of the investments, blood and sweat and all of that, not literally, that um, our colleagues have invested in making Massey Cancer Center what it is. It's another great example of interdisciplinary work. The governor has helped again by proposing a significant uh, so a sum of support for a Massey Cancer Center. This year, it'll be six plus million. I'm also really pleased that we were able to open the, Mar the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Evaluation Center, one of the very few of its kind in the United States. Um, at this point, I want to close and start transitioning to your questions, but why do I do this? Why is this important for me? I really look forward to this every year. The reason I look forward to it is, again, because at the levels at which I'm required to run in order to represent VCU well, I don't get to see all of you as often as I would like. And it's important for you to know that I do understand the state of the university, both the great things that are happening and the challenges that we face, and I do understand the incredible investments that so many of you make. And you do it without the kind of appreciation that I would like to be able to show you in the long term. Um, we do it without the number of colleagues that we should have. That's why I'm trying to add to the faculty as best I can. Um, it's, it's a challenge, but we're making it through that challenge with flying colors. And the flying colors are the great results that we see and the transformed lives of the students that bring us together when they become graduates, and while they're students for that matter. So. Thanking you is a really important part of why I wanted to get together. I do want to mention um, that last week we had an interesting meeting focused on, and it really helped me thinking, to think about my appreciation for my faculty colleagues, um, Bob Andrews and, um, and June Nicholson made a report last week in the context of some work that they're doing. And, Bob um, specifically made a reference to some things I appreciated. He referred to us as a team. I think that's important. We are a team. We need to be a team. There aren't many of us in light of the great mission that we have to, to fulfill. And I really appreciated that term. Um, it also reminds me that so much of what we're doing day in, day out is really, it really rests on our relationships as people. Um, and those relationships have to be based in trust and respect that is mutual. And I feel that we're making great headway in that regard, and I'm very, very grateful. We'll have lots of academic and professional matters that we will have to take up together. Um, I, again, cannot thank you enough for what you do to make VCU the enjoyable experience that it is for, the, for all of us. Um, the contributions are incredible, and I can't find, obviously, enough ways to say thank you. So a final thank you. At this point, I'd be pleased to try and take your questions. Dan? Mike, I've got a question about scholarly publishing in our faculty and some ambiguity in our quest for distinction. OK. Um, the quest for distinction calls for the faculty to be involved with community-engaged scholarship. Mm -hmm. I interpret that as meaning scholarship that our communities, both professional, local, and worldwide, can actually read and benefit from the work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, education faculty work can be read by teachers in the field, social mm -hmm. workers, nurses, and so on. The, another part of the quest for distinction calls for the use of uh, more careful measurements of our faculty's 
scholarly productivity through the scholarly productivity index. I want to engage uh, Bev Warren, our provost, uh, first, and then I'll share some thoughts with you. I think, Dan, um, Quest isn't meant to be prescriptive at the unit level. It is meant to be prescriptive in terms of its focus on excellence. And I think you just named the fact that scholarship comes in all shapes and sizes and for many different purposes. And I think Quest gives us that option to value research from a number of perspectives. So if I were uh, honest in the answer, I would say that as we're looking at the Faculty Scholarly Productivity Index, uh, which, which sounds <coughs> ominous, but what I think it can uh, um, be a platform for us for, as a university is if we're going to strive to be a premier urban public research university, we have to really focus on some of those factors. But I don't think it would cause us to ever lose sight of the fact that we want to disseminate that information uh, for the best of good for the community as well as for our discipline. So I guess my long-winded answer would be, I don't think Quest says it's either or. I think Quest says it's this and this. And I think we'll define excellence with academic units helping us to define that excellence for what it means. I have a sculpture colleague who comes almost every session and, and really is concerned about how does the faculty scholarly productivity index apply to a faculty member in the arts. I, I just think it's, it's wrong to think it's, it's one and that's it. It, it's, it's a way to give us some visibility nationally, but not to lose sight on the value of all, all forms of uh, scholarship. I don't think uh, doing international newsletters are going to add one iota in promotions. So if this is going to be introduced in our p and changes, it needs to be coming from the university because we are doing a lot of this kind of work Actually, and I don't think that there is any appreciation when it comes to a PNT committee in a school. We do have an ad hoc committee looking at promotion and tenure, and one of the national scholars in the area of community engaged scholarship came to speak to that ad hoc committee. So I asked them to address how we would have markers of excellence <coughs> across broad uh, areas, including community based research. So I'm hoping that we'll see some of those changes as this committee sends its report to us in, I hope, April. One of the things that you said that's really critical to this, Dan, is that, you know, we, we could sit here and talk about what we want to talk about, and that hopefully will influence folks, but we, we recognize that most of the choice, the decision point, in almost any unit is really going to rest with our faculty colleagues, and so what we should do is try to influence that with conversations like this. Um, but the fact of the matter is that um, I can't envision any university um, telling every unit what constitutes the kind of performance that ultimately at a major national research university is required in order to achieve um, any lift upward, whether it's tenure or promotion or um, anything else that, that might be judged in order to elevate one in the community. So. Um, I think the conversation is good, but I would hate for us to, to mislead ourselves into thinking that without having conversations in each of the units, that there will be change overnight. It probably won't be the case. Um, you heard me say earlier, and I'll just repeat, that it's really important that, that you look at the ways in which grants are being now awarded. Grants are being awarded on the basis of impact, right? If impact can be measured, then, and it's at a high level, you have a much greater chance of getting a grant. Well, you also need to show that impact, I think, um, in the context of your work um, uh, of scholarship or creativity or, um, or even research. So in any case, I think it's really important for us to, to, to focus um, on the department level and finding ways to, to have that conversation in each of the departments or for that matter units within departments that make separate decisions about promotion and tenure. But I think your point is very good 
And um, I think that this frustration is not just one that exists at VCU. It's starting to emerge at lots of institutions across the country. It's a good conversation, but one that we will unfortunately not resolve right away. Um, I'm glad it came up today, and I would encourage people to take this conversation back to their units. Maybe talk about it in the Faculty Senate and also go back. And I think the ad hoc committee on promotion and tenure is a good place um, for the university to try to influence some of the thinking that goes on um, that ultimately results in people's votes, if you will, <laughs> for promotion and tenure. Okay. You mentioned competitive uh, funding or grants for competitive students coming in so that we attract some better students into our university. Yes, sir. But I'm concerned more at the other end. We have a lot of disadvantaged students coming in into VCU, and I see them in my classroom. Mm -hmm. They are bright students. They don't have a 3.8 or a 3.9 because they come from very disadvantaged backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And they struggle just to pay the tuition. Uh, they work 20 hours, 30 hours. Sometimes, basically, they can't come to class because there's nobody to babysit their kids back at home. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether, as, as part of Quest, uh, there, we are trying also to build up our funding from that end so that students like this, I, I don't know if there's a mechanism to spot students mm -hmm. like this, but I see them in class every semester. And I'm wondering if we can do something to encourage these students, support them so that they can come up in their lives. Ultimately, if you make it over the bar and you get into Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, you are competitive. And that will continue to be more and more the case because, as you know, the bar continues to rise a bit every year. So you've really put your finger on the problem. The problem is that in 2009, when we took a quick measurement, we found that internally, we had one-tenth, 10% of the internal aid that University of Virginia had. Um, different sizes of student populations, ours was actually larger, so it's probably worse than that if you looked at it on a per student and uh, per needy student basis. Um, we had half of what Virginia Tech had. And so when I say competitive aid for competitive students, I'm saying to get students to come to the university, um, we need competitive aid for them. And what, co what constitutes the need for aid, as you know, is what the federal government has said for years constitutes that need. The federal government has guidelines. So we ask students to complete a FAFSA, and we try to figure it out that way, right? For the very neediest students, the federal government is very helpful. But then we have other students who are sort of in between. And you may be talking about some of those students who are in between. Those are the students who we get concerned about. Those are the students who we think can perform very effectively. Remember that when we put our 2010-11 budget together, I proposed and we moved forward with a proposal that no student who was at or below the poverty level would go with a tuition increase in the sense that we were going to provide that difference, right? So we do try to find ways to cover those students. I think the real issue ultimately is, does VCU internally have enough of a resource to put towards students? Um, we have not raised enough money like our peers have raised. I'm talking national peers um, in the form of scholarship. That's why we launched the $50 million Opportunity VCU campaign. We've made some headway toward it, but I'm not satisfied. I'm just really not. Um, despite the market. I mean, you're either passionate or you're not. You want to give to this cause or you're not. Um, I just don't think we're asking enough yet. We're getting there, but we need to make a lot more progress along those lines. So the private funding, and then we need to figure out how to, how to decide what portion of our budget um, legitimately can be dedicated toward competitive aid for competitive students. And um, I can assure you that with the FAFSA, and with the federal government's role and focus on the neediest students, we'll take care of the neediest students. It's after that that I actually start getting concerned. And it's those students who will tell you, I'm working all these jobs, I have some income, but the problem is I need a little bit more in order to make it, to, to add one class or to, to, to slow down my work schedule and add one class. Right, absolutely. So it's all about competitive aid, for competitive students. The students who come to VCU, 
are competitive. They must be competitive. They must be motivated. They must be ready. And they must add to the diverse landscape of this institution. We talked about some of these things. There was an article in the, in the Times Dispatch this week uh -huh. talking about some of the things that, that institutions did to just put themselves up in the ranks that, that weren't really serving the purpose about what's happening to maintain that balance. And I think, again, we've talked about some balance here of how do we try to elevate, get ranked, get visible, but at the same time, not to the point that we're not fulfilling what the Commonwealth wants us here for, to educate students, to provide good talent for our employers in, in the state and so on, all to get ranked somewhere. Huh? It's an arms race of sorts, you know, that, that gets out of hand at times. Um, I pay attention to that stuff to the extent that I think anybody who we're really interested in might pay attention to that. Um, I certainly will not let myself get consumed in that. Ultimately, the best way to fulfill um, your, your or, or to make achievements in terms of rankings is substantively um, um, making appropriate promises and then fulfilling them. So um, I, I won't disagree with you. I think that's right. I think that's right. In, in VCU, I'm sad to have to say, has so few resources in, in terms of what we're trying to do with this large number of students who we love serving. Um, there's not a lot of extra money to do much of anything with compared to the institutions you're probably talking about. So um, I, I'm with you. I agree. I think it's a good point, and I think we need to continue to fulfill the appropriate promises. Yes, sir. And the question is now with this um, group of students who can join as juniors, having come in from yeah. the junior college piece. Yes. And also with the various graduate programs, where do you see the priorities in terms of applying the limited resources? Is it at the undergrad level for those entering or matriculating for all four years? Uh -huh. How much would you put into the group that's only going to be here for their, the second half of their undergraduate career? Or how much emphasis would you put on the, the graduate programs? Sure. What's your thoughts on these three areas? Yes, a very easy question. <laughs> Thank you. Well, not controversial. Yeah, no, no, no. That's a good question. No, that's a great question. And you gave me a window because when I, I just thought about the fact that when I spoke, wherever I put those notes down, um, I didn't really uh, talk enough about graduate education. And it's not because graduate education isn't a top priority. It's just that you can only really focus in, in one year from one year to the next. On, on certain things in really concentrated ways. But if you look at Quest, graduate education is a really big part of that. Um, I have some really specific thinking about graduate education. I spent a lot of time on it before and will continue to do that. Um, Doug uh, with Bev is doing some great work there. They know, uh, I've had some conversations with you two about this. I really think that one of the things we've gotta do is make sure that the stipends are competitive as well. Um, I'm concerned that they are not today. Um, I look at the stipends and wonder a little bit about whether we need to maybe think about having the right size of student population at the graduate level and the right size of, um, of, of stipend. Um, we probably need to give some serious thought to um, in the long run um, where we want to add PhD programs and why. Um, I think we need to. But I think we need to be sure that they have um, a substantive role, ultimately, in society and in educating um, students, whether it's here or elsewhere. Um, I'm concerned that, that um, sometimes we talk uh, about PhDs in, in pure disciplines. And I think that's OK. And that works in some places, like electrical engineering. I understand why we would do that versus go the other way. Um, but there are some areas, and that's why we did the PhD in electrical engineering. But um, in most areas, that, that really is the name of the game, right? It's, it's focusing on what the future needs will be. Um, so I, I don't anticipate until we can figure out other things at other levels how we could suddenly expand largely the number of PhD programs. Although if the college or schools can come up with money to do that, um, I, I think that they ought to pursue it. Um, and they ought to pursue it with a, a really strong sense of its feasibility. Um, but I really do think a key piece of that feasibility is competitive stipends. And I don't know that our, com our stipends are competitive enough today. So I'm hoping we can find ways. And I don't know what all of those ways will be, but find ways to make those more competitive over time. 
You mentioned transfer students too. Um, I think that I have an idea there um, that we have not yet been able to really focus on. But one of the things that you can do, um, competitive aid for competitive students, um, is you can bring, um, you can guarantee um, admission to a student who decides to start at a community college and then start booking resources for them based on a certain level of performance academically um, at the community college. And uh, the, the booking is only a credit good for you if you come to VCU. Um, but that's an opportunity for us too um, that I think in the long run we're going to have to consider. We have so many priorities right now that we're trying to put them in order. Um, in the midst of having lost $63.5 million out of the $200 million uh, base budget, um, a base appropriation, I should say. So we make, remember, everything else we've got has come from other sources, whether it's been fundraising or tuition. And, um, you know, we all have a good conscience, so we want to be sure that everything that we do um, is a good investment in expanding um, the success of our students by, by being sure that the experiences that they have are, are substantive. Um, the, the, the freshman end of it really isn't the only end of it that we're looking at um, by any means. In fact, in many places, the what they call professional master's degrees, um, where someone is working in an environment and then they um, take a course online, um, I suppose the English version of course would mean degree program online. Um, what that does is that creates a source of revenue and funding to support other programs, stipends, enriching those. So that's one of the reasons I have, have been so um, passionate about pushing online learning. I think that there are plenty of people at the master's level who can, alert, who can learn very effectively online. If you don't give them that chance to do that, it, it really is um, very difficult for them in their lives. And there are some programs, I can tell you, people will say, my first choice would be VCU, but I can't go to VCU. I can't get there. Even if I live in Chesterfield, I can't get there. It's just not going to work out, so I can't do it right now. They would do it online, and so we are making some headway in some of those areas as well. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate this time with you. <laughs>